Hello, welcome. We are here to play the lovely Somnolent, an incursion I wrote for Trophy Dark. Uh, Trophy Dark is a collaborative role play game, but we're going to get into that like further along. But I want to get to some player introductions first. I'm Mads, she, they pronouns, and I play and run a lot of Trophy, <laughs> uh, both flavors, dark and gold. And I really enjoy the system and I wanted to do some writing for it. So um, I've play tested this a couple times already, but I figure I want to trot it out yet again and see how it goes. All right, so uh, let me pop corn over this to Ben. Ben, um, I have played Trophy Dark once and Candlelight once, which I've heard described as Trophy Backwards. Um, and currently we're playing Trophy Gold, which is my first time playing a trophy that is not dark. And Rob? I'm Rob. Um, he, him. I have played Trophy Dark and Gold many times. Absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't even couldn't even guess how many times. <laughs> yep. Dozens. Pretty much. All righty. So I'm going to go ahead and go do a round of cats, which is concept, aim, tone, and subject matter, setting expectations on the table for all of us that are playing today. Um, again, to make sure that, you know, we're all on the same page in terms of uh, what this is going to entail for gameplay. Um, let's see. Okay. So the system is trophy dark by Jesse Ross. It is a collaborative storytelling game about a group of treasure hunters on a doomed expedition into a place that does not want them there. Um, <clears throat> the game tells the story of these treasure hunters going into physical and mental descent as they move deeper and deeper into the incursion. Their journey ultimately brings them to ancient ruins that hold the treasures they seek and the monstrous entities that dwell there. This is not a hopeful story of brave and daring adventurers that slay dragons and drag bags of gold back to town. This is a horror story of entitled pillagers meeting tragic ends. You will play, as part of the aim, you will play treasure hunters motivated by a near impossible goal to seek out riches in the forgotten places of the world. You are not heroes, but entitled or desperate pillagers there to secure your wants and needs. The treasure hunters are doomed and they probably won't achieve their goal. Instead, they are very likely to die by the end of the game, and watching how they go out is part of the fun. The tone of Trophy Dark is desperate and often tragic. You will likely encounter conflict or tension between the treasure hunters, where the <clears throat> characters are encouraged to backstab or betray their companions in pursuit of their goal. The subject matter, the game will be R-rated, your treasure hunters are risk takers willing to make dangerous choices. The game will likely be violent, terrifying, and include scenes of bodily horror and loss of self-control. And this particular incursion, well, with most of Trophy Dark, is uh, has the possibility of PC betrayal, um, as well as body horror, manipulation, temptation, and violence. So those are some content warnings for this particular incursion, okay? Uh, let's see. Oh, and the gameplay. The gameplay itself is highly collaborative and improvisational. Players have a lot of say over the world itself and can introduce story elements that no one, not even the GM, was expecting. And play moves between the fiction and the metagame frequently. The game runs best when everyone feels comfortable offering up their ideas. And it uses six-sided dice of two colors, light and dark, to determine the outcome of risky actions. We will be using a dedicated trophy dice roller that gives us the light and dark die and the results therein. <laughs> so um, we're going to go ahead and use that. Uh, we do have a safety. Given the subject matter, we're going to have a safety tab, which um, includes the lines and veils. Lines are things that we, were, we will not cross, we will not include in our game. Um, and veils are things that may come up maybe part of a backstory, but we won't describe in any detail. We'll fade to black on, on, the, um, on that particular topic. Um, and other safety tools that are available to us are the X cards. So if something is objectionable in an unfun way or something comes up that 
oh, like maybe that wasn't triggering before, but it is, you know, for that particular moment or scene, it's like you can call X card out, you can do X in the video or X in the chat, and then we'll stop play, find out what needs to be X carded, take it out and move on. And then um, we won't ask why that particular thing needed to be X carded, okay? And then there's also the safety tool of open door. So for whatever reason, if you need to step back from a scene or you gotta get the, get your food from the delivery person, <laughs> you know, you can like open door for that particular uh, few minutes or the scene. Um, or if it, this game isn't for you after playing for a few minutes, I mean, that's fine too. Just like say you're gonna open door, just let us know if you're coming back. Um, and then, uh, you know, that's perfectly fine to use the open door for this. Um, you don't have to explain why, okay? Um, and so hopefully the players have marked off their lines and veils. Um, this is a living document, so if anything changes or if anything, um, you know, comes up again, triggering like later on in the game for whatever reason, which we will not ask about, then just again, I, you know, call it out to to just check the safety tab um, for different things, and then we will approach with caution or, again, take it out depending, okay? Okay, so just going to double check character creation now that we've gone over um, the safety as well as the cats, and uh, when we come back, we're going to introduce these characters and then start gameplay in earnest. All right, so our players have created characters. I'm going to go in order of the uh, character keeper. And so we're going to start with Ben. Please introduce us to your character. Great. Uh, today I am playing Tierden, who uses he, they pronouns. Uh, his occupation is a snake. Uh, and this lends him skills in charm, trickery, and performance. Um, and he is a noble, but he's been disinherited. Um, which lends him the skill appraisal. Uh, he wants to undo this wrong and earn the right to his family's name. Um, in his uh, the, the course of being cast out and trying to worm his way back, uh, he's he's learned a couple of rituals: compel and mask. Compel is force a creature to perform a non-lethal task, or free a creature from a prior compel and mask allows one to cover one's face to remove themselves from others' senses. Very cool. All right, and Rob, please introduce us to your character. Uh, my character's Ekamea. He uses she, her pronouns. Ekamea is a hedge, given her skills in improvisation, rituals, and spirits. And her background is an unmasked, unmasked Feyborn giving her skill in illusions. Um, she wants to give her betrothed the present they crave. And rituals entangle, cause plants to twist and grasp, holding or slowing a creature. And dryad, stay still to transform into a tree and communicate with other trees. Oh, that's going to be an interesting duo here coming into this place. All right. So... Um, as part of character creation, my incursion includes some questions um, about how the character knows the princess. So I will read out the, the uh, prologue in a little bit, but um, just want to make that part of the character creation and ask, Teoden, you were her confidant. What did she tell you long ago that sent you away? And why are you back now? She told me that she knew that she was going to be cursed um, and that she was looking forward to it, that she welcomed this, this outcome. Um, and it made no sense to me why she would simply give in to this fate. And I asked and asked, and she would not tell me why, why she would, was going to be cursed, uh, why she was excited to be cursed, why this was a way out for her. Um, and this like created a tension between us that broke our bond. And uh, I said some things I shouldn't have and was passed out. Uh, 
but I need to know why. So I'm coming back. Okay. All right. And Ekamea, you were her playmate, correct? Or yes. childhood playmate. What did you do to make her fear you, but still come back for your company? I think the princess would sneak out to play with me in the woods and I scared her with magic such as taking her like traveling through trees deeper into the woods. But the things I was able to show her in the heart of the forest kept her coming back. Hmm. So scary, but interesting. The prologue. The call has gone out to commoner and noble alike. The king has escaped to a nearby land, his castle overrun and overgrown with the thorns and brambles of a dark undergrowth, his people set in stone. Save my daughter, he entreats. She is asleep, stricken by a foul curse. Only by true love's kiss will she awaken and the blight be dispelled from the land. He extols her virtues, and if there are riches and wealth within those walls that you come across, then by all means, let it spur you to greater glory when you awaken the princess, earn her love, and claim a kingdom. However, if you fail or become lost to the environs of the cursed land, you will join the people in their forever vigilance amongst the dark shadows of these twisted briars. The theme of this incursion is Briar Rose. The castle is seen from afar, crumbling battlements, rocky terrain, broken statues are here. The only way to tell between actual sculpture and the subjects turned to stone from the curse are the expressions on their faces. The terror, the gaping mouths of silent screams, the wide, unseeing eyes. One wonders what they saw before being turned. But yet, the unseen servants, rumored to be there still, there are still those that serve here. They escape the fate of those frozen in, tone, in time and stone, but perhaps their calling is much worse. Unseen, unable to be touched or heard, and yet their presence is felt in these rubbled halls. Some of their finery, the resplendence, still exists, and they live to keep the spirit of the opulence going. Ring one, the page. It is as if the blight of the briars creeps every year, the sweet, heady smell of wild roses surround you, and the thorny vines reach like little talons through the wood. As you approach the final road to the overgrown lands by the castle, you see the dim glow of a campfire. Tell me before I describe what you see near the campfire. Tell me how you two approach. What do you look like and do you say anything to each other? Are we together at this point? Or is this how we I, I, you guys are starting off together. So, you know, your companions, I mean, for how long? We don't know. <laughs> we even just met wandering the woods on the way here. Uh, I'd like to imagine that. I probably got lost. I think I, I, I may be a, a little too confident in my ability to navigate these woods, but uh, but Ekamea knows the woods, maybe personally. <laughs> yeah, very much so. I think the idea of getting lost in the woods is pretty alien to her. So I don't know if uh, if you took pity on yeah, me maybe. or uh, saw a, a chump who might be useful later, but whatever the reason. Mm. Uh, maybe helped us towards the fire. 
What do you look like as you approach? And do you approach with caution or do you approach with casualness, I guess? Is there anyone at the side? You can see. Yes. You recognize the group around the fire, I believe. It's a rival band of adventurers. They are menacing a young man in tattered clothing too small for his frail frame, who bears the marks of briar scratches and dried blood on the exposed parts of his body. And you catch the words as you come closer. <laughs> Maybe a lofty king will be paying a pretty price for your head, <laughs> seeing as you escape the cursed castle. <laughs> what do you do? And to think it's none of my business. But uh, I'm also, uh, I've, I've got leaves jut uh, jutting out of my like unkempt overlong hair and uh, dirt smeared somewhere from having tripped on a root. I'm not really in a shape to protest uh, if you are to guide us towards the fire. Yeah, I can I have a gesture for silence and put a finger to her lips and try to move closer and just see how many are in this group there is the lead one who is bigger and burlier than the rest and he leads three others i would Tempted to use a ritual even this early. Sure. Why not? When it's we're risky, in deep right? Woods. We're in yeah. deep woods and there's briar around, and mm -hmm. I have the entangled uh, ritual, which I would like to get the plants around this fire to kind of grab the those, the people bullying this young man and like grab them and pull them backwards over the log they're sitting on and sure. entangle okay. them. Absolutely. Okay. So the way <clears throat> Trophy Dark works is that it's on a, on a ring structure. Uh, you know, um, we have five different rings to get through, so we'll see if we get through them all. And on any risky action, it's like we build a dice roll. Okay. So the way it works is for risk rolls to get the, if you're going to do an a ritual you automatically incur the first the, the dark die because it's dangerous to do this kind of magic and it's a risk to your mind or body depending on um, you know the effect of the ritual and then you get the first light die for a skill from your occupation or background that applies or you know something useful that you're using to to enact this uh, ritual have the skill of rituals. Perfect. Okay. I'm good at this kind of thing. Exactly. All right. Now, to increase your odds of success for this dice roll, um, you need you could get a second light die, and that comes from offering up a devil's bargain. So we would offer up something that would happen no matter what. We always preface our devil's bargains with no matter what, because it will happen regardless of roll, of how the roll works. Okay, so Ben, do you have anything? And I will try to offer up something as well. No matter what, uh, the plants that twist and, and stretch out may get a little too close to the fire and could spread it. And I'm going to say that regardless of how it goes, that maybe those vines and branches that you're using or vines that you're using for this uh, ritual they're not going to make any distinction and they're also going to to try and entangle the young man as well it's both good i'm gonna go with the fire i think okay all right cool all right so that's two light one dark to roll on risk roll please that's a six light six light all right so 
in this case, you completely succeed. Please tell me how it looks as you're doing the ritual and what happens when it does beautifully succeed against the, the bullies. Yeah, I think Echinaya kind of moves very silently through the undergrowth toward, toward them. And at a certain point, she just crouches down behind a, behind a tree root and closes her eyes and it's almost like she's sub vocalizing and what we see is the shadows begin to reach out in the firelight to stretch toward these these people from behind them so you know they don't notice until it's too late and suddenly these these roots these thorn wrapped Brambles are all around them and pulling them backwards over the over where they're sitting and and away from the fire and leaving the young man standing there. But I think yeah, the the ends of some of these vines are catching and they're probably some of that nice rich oily sap is starting to go up quite nicely. And you see this happening and i think because the vines are you know again wrapped around these people i mean they're starting to catch fire too they're not exactly wearing things that are flame retardant and also as the fire builds it's spreading in this camp site that they've that they've that they've done and the brush around them starts to starts to catch as well what else do you do Young is the young man is cowering as far away as he can, like you know, to get to get away from the fire and the snatched people. Yeah, does it look like the fire is reaching towards the the brambles as well? Uh, basically, I mean, like you know, they're they're uh, spreading like almost in like a concentric circle because of the way the vines have come out mm -hmm. to grab them. So, yeah, I mean. Yeah. Do what you're gonna do, but do it quick. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah, I think without without thinking, seeing what's going on, um, Tudin's just uh, running for the boy, seeing that there there's an opening, just to try and get him out of this situation. All right, so this one is also going to incur a risk roll for a different reason. So, this would be the light, the, excuse me, the dark die for the risk to your body, because I mean, like you could get caught in the flames. And then your first light die would be from uh, any skill that you have to help you with this from occupation or background. And if you want to mention any kind of like personal equipment that you possibly have on your person, I am completely fine with it, you know, to help you. Uh, I'd make an argument for appraisal. I think uh, Tierden's motivation here is someone who's been there and come out could be of value to him sure okay i'll take it all right and then uh the second light die comes from a devil's bargain rob what do we think no matter what i think no matter what this young man is gonna not cling to you from now on he's gonna look to you as his rescuer his savior and just follow you, follow you around. Mm, interesting, interesting. Um, my devil's bargain is okay. Well, let me ask you something first before I before I give you the devil's bargain. Um, you're betrothed. Is it someone that you've met in the interim? Oh no, like I'm sorry, that's not you. Sorry. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, no, your the, the your fam your family's name. Your family's yes. name. Is it something that your family disinherited you from, or was it the king? Um, I think both. I, I think I think I I became a like something of a pariah. What did you do? Um, I think after after the business with with. Uh, disagreeing slash fighting with the princess. I um, 
started to, I think I was already a snake back then. Um, and I started collecting and spreading rumors, uh, poisonous rumors um, about anyone and everyone. I think that the, the, the young man is going to have one of those rumors like, you know, that he's heard about and he's going to throw it back in your face. He's going to be, he's going to be indignant and, and blame you for leaving. But he becomes obsessed with me or he knows me and hates me. Yeah. Oof. Um, or you don't have to take either one. That's the other, that's the beauty about the devil's bargain. You could also not accept the, anyone and then you don't get that second light die. So. Yeah, that's true. What is the success in, in trophy? Six. <laughs> Getting a six. Okay. Well, four and uh, five is also like a mixed success. With a complication, but usually yeah. that means yeah. I give you a condition of some sort or something mm -hmm. complicated yeah. really yeah. happens. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll take that he he recognized me and hates me. Okay. Okay. Huh? Wow. It's a six light. Yeah, I'm rolling quite well so far. And you just said something, said so it's going <laughs> to <Yeah>. be... <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's All okay. Right. I welcome the chaos. Sure. So so tell me how you um, succeed in, in getting this young man, like, you know, away from the fire, away from the bullies, and... Um, yeah, just bring him out of this 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 chaos. I don't think I let the the impulse that he could be of value to us sort of take over, and uh, like shaking off the sticks and leaves, um, just make a, a run for it and just kind of tackle him out of the maybe we roll a little bit out of the way of the spreading flames. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, and he's he's frail as anything. He's almost, almost uh, skin and bones. And, uh, you know, you you almost find it like, you know, uh, rolling with a, a pile of, of sticks wrapped in wrapped in rags. Um, he's that he's that slender. And um, yeah, I mean, the fire rages a bit. And strangely enough, it's like it recedes is almost as if like the the brambles and the vines are like kind of closing it off themselves like tamping them tamping themselves down and when the fire finally dies down um, it's dark again and you don't see any sign of those other <laughs> adventures they're gone whether that be dragged away by the other vines or something else you don't know but uh oh the young man is is panting in your arms uh Teod, and, and he's oh, thank you thank you sir thank you thank you very much and he looks he looks beyond um uh you Teoden, to look at um Akamea and and says was that your doing that was that was brilliant <gasps> Water? <coughs> you water? I'm sure we can find you some water. What were they doing to you? Why were they doing that? They said they were going to <clears throat> take me back to the king and and sell me off or something. I, I don't know. They were they were they were teasing me and and, and calling me names. And I just, I just escaped. But before that, you escape. were in the brambles? It's, it's wild out there. I mean, you saw, like, all, even, even the road, like, along the road, it's like all those, all those, those, those thorny vines and, 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 the, the bushes underneath, it's like, it's almost like it, it trips you as you're going past. But I was trying to get away so fast. Yeah. From what? What was in there? 
it was like I... I was frozen where I stood. And then all of a sudden I was awake. And I saw... I saw... I saw the housekeeper. Miss Scar. And she was... Stone. I... I touched her face. And... I ran. Am I going in the first place? I'm sorry? Do I go in in the first place? I, I was there. I, I, ah, I was I was there when the, when it happened. When, when it happened. And I'm you notice from much. his from his build, you notice from his build that again he is wearing clothing that looks like it is way too small, like the remains of clothing that looks like it was way too small for him. You know, he's like about maybe seventeen, and this looks like for a younger <laughs> a younger page basically. How long ago did you escape? I, I don't know. I, I, it was day when I woke woke up, and then now it's it's night. I ran until they captured me or what have you, and they were going to bring me back to the king in the morning. Old, sir? Um, well, seven. Yeah, I'm seven. Although, and then he starts to look at his hands. Maybe not. I think Hekamaya just looks towards the other with a half a smile on her face. You be Perhaps going... the curse is already weakening. You, you be going to the castle. That's the plan. Huh. You know the way. And he will stop upon that question. And his eyes roll back into his head. And he stands stock still. And he intones. Be careful of the moat. It steals people on the way to the castle. And then he roll the eyes roll back down in his head. And he just kind of shakes his head and says, I know I, I was just going through the, through the archways and the bridge. The bridge is really messed up. And um, it's uh, I just followed the path. Path led to some town, right? And where are you going to go now? I think the, what was the nearest town? Uh, Edgemoor? Right? Do you have people there? Uh, my my old gran. She should she should still be there, right? Maybe. Water. It's worth a shot. You have any water? Sorry. Mm -hmm. Probably somewhere. I can only assume we do. Yeah, I mean, like if you offer if you offer water, he's gonna <clears throat> take the skin and then he's just gonna drink <clears throat> drink deeply of it. Mm -hmm. Do you ask? Mm -hmm. Do you ask him any more questions? Is there anything that we should keep an eye out for once we get in there? Anything to be aware of, other than a bunch of statues? Uh, he, <clears throat> the eyes roll back in his head, and he stand. He sits stock still again, while clutching the water skin. And he intones first, looking sightlessly at you, Teoden. Eat nothing at the feast, 
There is nothing of value for you there. And then he will slowly turn again towards you, Akamea, with sightless eyes and say, A great beast roams the halls. Beware. And then his eyes roll back down. And as he's clutching the skin, he looks over at you, Teoden, and really takes a hard look. Wait. Do I know you? Were you at court a while back? We, well, but you were young. I don't know if we would have met. No, I reckon I recognize you. You look older. You... That's rude. You were the one, you were the one that was saying all that mean stuff about the princess. <gasps> what are you doing back here? Uh, I'm making amends. Let's sit, let's, let's go with that. I'm, I'm making up for the, the, the wrongs I allegedly committed back then. People saying scurrilous stuff about her. And even the servants' quarters. You should be ashamed. <sighs> oh, drink, drink your water. I, I appreciate it. I thank you. But I'm surprised you didn't poison the, poison the water with your rumors. Oof. <sighs> no, I would have used poison for that. Thank you for getting me away from those people. I think I'll go now. Good luck. Sure thing. He says this yeah. specifically. He says it specifically to you, Ekamea, not to Tay Odin. <laughs> Very fair. No, I, uh, before he goes, I'll, I'll wrench the water skin back out of his hand a little too hard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, and he just kind of like looks back and and just uh, you know, stares at you both, and then uh, we'll we'll head along his way, like you know, down the road, which, from where you came, from where you had come, like if you'd come through the forest, if you had uh, been like on the road for even a little bit, like you know, farther back, you would have realized it's like you know, it was pretty clear, it was it was a pretty clear road uh, up until this point like up until the point where it started to meet up with the pathway leading to the castle itself. So. And as the, you know, as he leaves to head towards the nearest town, which may or may not be Edgemore, it's like, what do you two do? So we might as well head towards the castle, no? No food at the feast? Beware of the moat. There is a monster roaming the halls. Not to mention that judging by that young man, it may take us quite some time to get there. He was not without his usefulness. Could have done without that last bit, but so it goes. The moon is overhead. It is full. It is bloated. But it shines, shines the pathway down and shows you just how overgrown it is as you get closer to the castle. And if you turn away and you head down that path, a page takes a furtive look at you both, takes three steps into the forest from the pathway and then disappears in a swirl of autumn leaves and rose petals. Such is the close of Ring One. Ring Two, the moat. You find yourself atop the last hill overlooking the path leading to the great moat, and beyond that, the briar-choked castle. 
Thorny vines seemed to twist and invade the very wood of the single bridge to its doors. It does not look like sure or sturdy footing. The doors to the castle grounds are high, arched, and firmly closed. There's a bridge to cross, though. Guess we have to cross it. To a wouldn't happen to want to go first, would you? I'm sure I can find my way across. You appear to be heavier than me. A fair assessment. Yeah, sure. Uh, but I'll feel safer once you've tested it. You can Very see. Well. You can see that it is not even uh, an even bridge. It rises, seems to crest, but then seems to be turned and twisted in a bit, as the vines are literally uh, infesting the cracks and going around the wood. So. And there is a large hole in the middle of it as you as you start to make your 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 journey. The plants have weakened the structure. So once you get to that large hole, do you jump over or do you find another way across? I think first I'll peer down into the hole and see what's below. If if I do try to jump, is something gonna reach up and grab me? I mean, as you look down, down that hole, every so often there's a body that comes to the cloudy surface of the moat. It's bloated and masticated, and then gets dragged back down by something. Here is the moat that the boy spoke of. It does seem that way. Um, do you see any way we might get across safely without risking a jump? Perhaps. And I have an idea here that maybe I can abuse my entangle ritual to create kind of a net of, you know, thorns and brambles across the hole so that there's something for us to hang on to, even if it's not the fastest going, it's better than the hole. So you are enacting the ritual? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's start with the what do we think will go wrong? Hmm. Maybe because of the magic of the castle and the curse, the plants will not be as strong. So when you do traverse, then it's just going to let go <laughs> and uh, may fall through anyway. <laughs> Any other what could go wrongs? The opposite. Uh, because of the magic of the castle, they're empowered to be too strong. And although they're supposed to carry you across, they'll grip onto to both of us and might make us easy pickings for whatever's beneath. Could be fun. Okay. Gather your dice. So, dark die for doing the ritual, for sure. Risking uh, mind, body. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, light and die. And I'm just good in rituals again. Good. Okay. Um, and then your second light die for increasing your odds of success is for the devil's bargain. What do we think will happen no matter what for Echinea? Hmm. This makes my life more difficult, but what if no matter what, uh, whatever you do in the process, your vines destabilize what's left of the bridge and it probably crumbles in your wake. Oh, <laughs> oh and that's uh, my way back. 
Yeah, right. Um, you're betrothed. Do you know what kind of present they want? I know what kind of present I think they want. Oh, yeah? What is it? What do you think they want? What I think it is, is flower grown from my own body. How do you get that flower from your body? Or how do you cultivate it from your body? As a ritual. I would become one with a tree and cause it to blossom. And a betrothed would pick one particular flower from the tree. I think the devil's bargain that I have is no matter what, regardless of, you know, if you succeed or fail, I think in the moat, you're going to see a body float up that actually has someone looking like your betrothed clutching that flower. So one, both. Or none of those devil's bargains. <laughs> what was the first one again? Sorry, that one was so. Bridge crumbles. Oh, that's right. The yeah. of the so vines. There's no way of way we're back out. I think the one with the betrothed in the in the moat is too delicious to pass up. Okay. All I don't right. know how I'm going to react to it, but. Well, that's <laughs> that's going to be the interesting part, not it. <laughs> so go ahead and take two light, one dark for your risk roll, please. Wonderful, that's a three light. So you can add a dark die and re-roll and see if you can get better. Get better. See if those thorns are clinging onto us a little too closely. That's better, that's a six light. Okay. All right, so, yes. You get a six light, okay. <clears throat> Tell me how your ritual succeeds in creating this you know, netting for you to get past you and Teoden to get past easily. Um, <clears throat> but I will, <coughs> but I will describe, uh, you know, or actually like, I'd like to, I'd like to hear you describe like the picture of your betrothed clutching this flower. In the middle. Yeah, I think there's a hole in the bridge where it's been twisted and pulled apart by the, the vines and brambles and when Ekamea does her, does the ritual, we hear that kind of creaking, writhing sound as the brambles and vines begin to reshape and, and grow into the into the gap. And she gets a look towards Teoden. It's not the most perfect way to cross, but it would. At the same time, it would be hard to fall through it. You know, it's kind of dense enough and tangled enough that the gaps are, are smaller than the body would easily fit through. Really and I think we start, we start to pick our way across and it's, you know, it's trying to grasp at us because this is really an abuse of the, it's not what the ritual is supposed to do. Right? It's, you know, the vines are trying to grasp at us so we're constantly, every, you know, every time we want to move a limb we have to pull these grasping tendrils away from it and the thorns are digging into our flesh and into our, into our clothes so it's really slow going and at some and at one point halfway across i think Etimaya happens to look down and just catches this glimpse of a face floating to the surface the two hands clutching a blossom below the face and she just stops halfway across wordless with her with her mouth open and as Teradin catches up to her you can just see a tear on her on her face 
because now by now the the face is gone again, but she's just waiting there to see if it, she sees it again, just confirm that it really was what she thought it was that she saw. Make a ruin roll, please. I command. One. My ruin is not currently less than one. Okay, so <clears throat> tell me how you keep it together. Speakers there and catches up to Akimaya. He is, I think. It can't be them. It can't be them. It's the trick of the light. It's. It's like this place. It can't be there. Did you see something? Not so, but it's impossible. They couldn't even, they couldn't even have the flower yet. I haven't grown it yet. Of course, of course it couldn't be them. Come on. You're not making sense, but I'll take your word for it. Teodin, as you, as you make your way across and either go past Ekame a little bit or maybe let her go in front of you. I think moonlight is gleaming overhead, showing you visions of the Silver Castle, reminding you of more prosperous times. What do you remember of the princess before she turned you away? and said she was looking forward to this curse. What was what was a happier time like being with her? It was um, I think she had this like, easy way of making you feel understood and comfortable. Um, I think uh, you could sort of feel that sense of ease and joy sort of suffused throughout the the palace, not just, you know, in conversation with her, but um, sort of in her whole court. Um, it sort of spread from from the way she carried herself and the, the little parties she would organize. I think I have some fond memories of of uh, any, uh, a summer evening uh, standing by one of the stone walls now crumbling over there uh, with a, a glass and uh, by the uh, the lamplight, just the, the, the chatter of the, the, um, the servants, you know, making their rounds, the, the nobles socializing chatting um really just just vibrancy and and life all sort of stemming from the princess's uh easy way of of spreading joy she always had a, a joke or a witty remark for anything which is why it made no sense you can see a light from the window highest in the remaining turret, I guess, of the castle. It's soft. It's welcoming. And you see in the window, coming in front of the light, the silhouette of the princess. What do you think when you see her? She seems to wave just to you, Teoden. What are you thinking when you see this? There must have been just, just some, there must have been some extreme, bizarre mistake or misunderstanding that maybe this was all some kind of, some kind of play or joke or, or strange scenario that was thought up as a lark and 
and you know maybe there was never really a curse at all she seems fine up there awake happy maybe even take a ruin roll please okay yeah it's one all right tell me how you keep it together to not fall prey to the environment I think um, as I, I stare up at uh, the silhouette in the window, um, waving, I maybe take a step forward on the, the vine and bramble covered bridge and the like prick pulls me back to, to myself and to reality um, because no, of course there's a curse because look at this place and look at where I am now and how I got here. Yeah. As you both make it to the <clears throat> the doors, <coughs> the doors of the, uh, at the end of the bridge, in front of the doors, you see a satchel carelessly tossed down in front of the castle door. <coughs> Pardon. And out from the satchel, are gleaming silver cups and cutlery spilling from it onto the ground. Oh, they won't be needing it, right? Could be valuable. Could be valuable. Could take it along with you. Think of the noise it will make to you then. I'm sorry? The noise. Uh, it will live... Could be noisy, yes. Yes. And I suppose if there's a beast roaming these halls, it would be better not to catch its attention. I don't think you'll be okay. fighting it off with a silver fork. <laughs> so, but as a point well made, I command. I, uh, we can always pick it up on the way out. I'll leave it be. The castle doors will creak open, leading into a cobblestone ruin of a courtyard. You raise your eyes. The highest tower is yours, if you can find your way up there. So closes ring two. Ring three. The Great Hall. You smell something incredible as you enter the courtyard. You realize it's coming from a wide opening in the side of the castle, leading to the Great Hall. For a few moments, you see how the hall looked so many years ago. Marble and gold gleaming, lush tapestries adorning the high walls. Two thrones sit on the dais at the far end. There's a large circular table here with the finest feast anyone has ever seen. There are four seats here at cardinal points, but the table is so large you feel as if you could be sitting alone. Do you sit at the table to see what is there? And what cardinal point do you pick to sit? Have you been in the castle before, Teodin? Anything else? I think I must have been long ago, but... Uh, I don't really remember this. this. So... So lavish. Who could it be for? Us? The smell is... Tantalizing. I know I've been warned not to eat, but surely it wouldn't hurt to sit for a moment. What cardinal point do you sit? Uh, I think probably the the far side. Let's say it's it's south. Okay. I 
Kamea. East. The rising sun. As you sit down to enjoy your favorite food, it is fortuitous that it was well to hand when you sat down. What is this dish that you enjoy to bursting? Could be a drink, could be a dish, could be a dessert. What are you eating so deliciously and delectably? I think for a Khmer is a altar of nuts, nut honey, and fruit, dried fruits, and a flagon of wine. What kind of wine is this? Very light. Ale. Not sweet, but fragrant. Wine. With a, how would you describe it? A, a jasmine or honeysuckle scent to it. Sweet and rich. And you, Teoden, what do you sit down to that fills you to bursting? To, uh, to carry on the, the sweet and rich alcoholic beverage uh, train. Um, I think there's a, a, a type of mead that was made at the castle from bees fed on special plants kept in the garden. And it's something that I longed for in the years when I was cast out and, and no mead lived up to the, the flavor of, of this. And so to see it here available uh, once more is too much to withstand. Um, and I think that's the, the main thing is uh, this, this sort of heady um, perfumed uh, drink that uh, really pulls me back to, to the time when things were good here. Uh, maybe a couple of like little uh, like cakes or other finger foods that might have been served at such a party. I think as you <clears throat> eat your fill and drink to the brim, I think you will notice that the mug itself is well turned and it has your family crest. And the little plate that has those delicious cakes has your, it's rimmed with your family name woven into its decoration. And Ekamea, I think as you are having the delicious nuts and dried fruits, you also see that the plate that it's on it's quite natural looking, but then it has, it has the same color as your blossom. And the flagon has a design reminiscent of how your blossom looks in full bloom. Each of you are enjoying this feast as much as you want, well to hand, for drinking and eating. Who sits next to you? You don't see your companion on the other side of the table. You are just so focused on your meal. But someone comes to sit next to you that you remember from your home or the past that drives you to stay and follow this quest to the end, no matter what. Who is that? From the home or from your past? It's not in the mother. 
Um, left in a village near the castle and, you know, was quite poor. And she was shunned by the villagers after I was born because well, once it became evident that my other parent must have been Faye. And at that point, we left the village and lived from then on in the woods. What does she say to you that's, that convinces you that this quest creating the present and or finding your playmate again is a good idea. I think she says something to the effect of whatever happened to that girl that you used to play with when he said she was a princess. I think she needs you. I think um, next to me sits uh, the princess's lady in waiting. Um, who I um, recognize because she was sort of the the other ear to which the princess would always turn. Um, and we got to know one another. And also she was the first and possibly worst victim of my rumor mongering because I thought that maybe it was her fault that the princess was acting this way. Some kind of, some kind of poison being whispered into her ear. But as she sits at this table next to me and gestures towards the, the implicit reassurance that I'm, you know, welcome as part of my family, as born on the dishes that I'm eating from, uh, she says to me that all will be forgiven if I simply continue on this quest and and you know, retrieve the princess because that would surely wash away any sin past committed and my family would be proud to have me back. She's talked to them, she knows. She does know. She knows with every confidence that you will be able to regain their favor. You win the hand of the princess before they disappear into the ethereal. What do they say warning you against Echimea? I think they say that she is of the brambles and the vines and will not hesitate to bring them into my way when the time comes. Nekamea, your mother warns you against Teoden. What specifically does she warn you against? She says that man means to deceive her. It is not to have a best interests in his heart, his own. You each look down at your empty plate, a dry, dusty, desiccated thing. What remains? 
reminding you of your drive. I think a single dried flower pet. I think at some point during this this exchange, uh, without noticing, the plate broke, and just the broken plate bearing my family's name is enough to remind me that I still have to earn it. As you realize that the feast is over. <laughs> I think you realize that things have reverted back to the way they were, the ruin, the fallen walls, some desiccated tapestry. The splendor of that long ago time dissolves away, leaving the ruinous crumble you see before you. The dais is partially collapsed, no chairs, and when you raise your eyes, it reveals the ebony darkness of the night sky. No stars for comfort, as the roof has a gaping hole where the stained glass used to be. A sonorous roar can be heard. For the feast dissolving, and for the roar that you hear, chilling you to your bones. Please take a ruin roll. Or my ruin does go up. Okay. Six, my ruin does go up. So, each in your own way, tell me what, what sends you more lost to the environment. Is it the fact that the feast and splendor has dissipated, or the roar that, again, shakes you to your core. What increases your your ruin? I think so, I it's that we were warned not to eat at this feast, and we did. And we were told things, and how can we trust what we were told, but also how can we trust each other given what we were told? I think uh, for Ted, and it's it's largely the the melting away of the vestiges of a time that really meant something to him. Uh, just sort of almost grasping at what he could have had, uh, and watching the feast melt away and the hall fall into ruin is just also send him a little bit into a into a ruin so closes ring three ring four the beast this is the rumored beast that haunts the castle guarding hunting those who would trespass you see great golden orange eyes appear at the hole in the roof the shape is indistinct with how well it blends into the forgiving dark, unforgiving darkness of the sky. Suddenly, you see bared bone yellow appearing as the beast grins with its large cracked pointy teeth, and it leaps. It leaps down to crash to the great hall below. It is immense, bigger than the bears seen in the forest, but impossibly lithe and sinewy claws unsheathing. The head is of a boar with a shaggy scruff and sharp tusks. A golden chain hangs from its neck, with an inscribed crystal pendant swinging from it. It lands in a crouch, scenting hard for those who have dared cross into his territory. Run. To face this beast means instant death. What do you do? Second run. Even though I think I want to use a ritual. Oh, okay. Um, I would like to use a mask mm. to okay. cover my face and remove myself from other senses. 
Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. What do we think will go wrong? Hmm. Easily, I mean, like, you know, your your ritual goes wrong and you're not able to cover yourself in time, and because of the delay, the beast is going to catch up to you. <laughs> yeah, or it can stalk you based on... It can't sense you, but it can sense the disturbance you make, you know, the footprints you leave and the, and the marks you... Shadow you cast, cool. so it can figure out where you are. Right. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Okay. So, take a dark dive for the ritual because it's risky for your mind and body, <clears throat> and it's inherently dangerous to do this kind of magic. Take a light die if it is something you are skilled at because of your occupation or your background. Agree. I'm sorry. Trickery, maybe? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Now your second light die, to increase your odds of success, is to accept a devil's bargain. No matter what. What do we think will happen? Hmm. No matter what, the ritual removes yourself from your own senses. <laughs> you can't see yourself in a mirror or hear your own voice or feel like your own body anymore. Literally. Oh, man. Oh, no. <laughs> um, oh, I, okay. Oh, man. I gotta beat that one. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> ah. I think in doing this particular ritual, I think... Even though you're wiping out yourself from other senses, you cannot wipe out the memories, the echoes of your scurrilous rumor mongering. And I think you're going to hear these echoes, all the things that you said about the princess and this lady in waiting or anyone here at court that got you kicked out. So you will constantly hear rumor whispers. Oh, and then so uh, sorry. I meant meant to do this like when you guys when your when your ruin went up. Akamea, your condition is how can we trust? And Teoden, your condition is what could have been. Really don't want to fail this roll. <laughs> so I'm thinking I might take both devil's bargains. Oh my god! Okay, okay. Oh jeez! Okay. Wow. So like, like the rumor mongering in your head and then you are removing yourself. And that will be all I sense, yes. Oh jeez. Oh Just no. A... Oh, I have something to like to, to really make it bad if you if you if you muck up this roll. <laughs> Alright, well, this is three light, one dark, right? So we'll see. Yeah, uh, two light, two light, one dark. <laughs> two light. I have a skill as well. Six right? light. Mm. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. Well what's with otherwise... these fun <laughs> rolls? <laughs> Yay, yay. Okay. All right. So tell me how this succeeds. Right. So the beast swivels its monstrous head towards, I guess, me because Akamea has already started to make a run for it. Mm -hmm. um, and I pull across a piece of cloth or Maybe I, I knew this ritual was coming at some point, so maybe I had a scarf that I put over my face. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the beast is left sort of sniffing air. It seems to have lost its lead just for the moment. But to me, as I pull this over my face, I too am, feel almost as if I'm floating, like dissociated from myself and I can still see and I can still smell but I also can't really hear because well, what I should be hearing is just relentless whispers um, but I can't remove the mask because that's certain death so I just try and stay upright while I 
creep around the side of this beast, whispers following me the entire way. Yeah, for sure. And um, <clears throat> Ekamea, um, what, like, what are you doing? Where do you go? The halls are vast. So, I mean, like, you know, you can, you know, you know, your goal is that high turret that is still somewhat intact. And that's where the princess's room is, uh, is purported to be. So, you know. I'm kind of plants growing through this castle now. Is it like infested with the mm -hmm. plants from outside or? Yeah. I mean, it's basically think of, think of the, um, the lands the the landscape of this like where there's like rubble and ruin but then there's also in the corners it's like you see like you know the peaking vines or like some of the thorny like thorny uh, uh brambles like kind of just like sticking out like they're they're kind of like clawing the walls and such so yeah they're around <laughs> i think i would also like to try a ritual okay um My dryad root allows me to stay still to transform into a tree and then communicate with other trees. So I think I want to echo my runs out of the out of the horn and, and loses herself in amongst the twisting corridors and rooms. Yeah. But then is going to try to evade the beast by hiding from it in the form of a tree, but also to ask the other the other trees and plants here the way to the tower oh sure that works okay so what do we think will go wrong <laughs> if you fail mm -hmm. i mean you have no idea what like sets the beast off necessarily i mean like it could be it could be movement it could be you know um uh, smell whatever but i mean like maybe it's not as good as it could be and so therefore the beast will mark and and track you you know that can be something that goes wrong you know and something that could go wrong is you could uh, like end up uh sort of partially completing the ritual such that your feet end up rooted but the rest of you does not transform Ooh, fun Okay, that's the that's the, what could go wrong. <laughs> All right, dark die, of course, because you're doing the inherently dangerous ritual. Light die, if this is something you are skilled at because of your occupation or background. It always feels like cheating just to say I'm skilled at rituals, but I'm skilled at rituals. Yeah. You're good at magic. Yeah, works for sure. And I would I would think like you know spirits could also count because I mean like you're talking to the other trees, which has other spirits mm -hmm. in them. So sure, why not? All right, second light die for the devil's bargain. What do we think will happen no matter what? I got one. So I think no matter what, when you connect with the network of plants, whether or not you're able to fully transform, um, they are of this place and of the curse. And so the information that they give you is going to feel off and strange and potentially untrustworthy um maybe not necessarily entirely wrong but it will hurt in some way uh, kind of like uh, piggybacking off of that a little bit i think these trees are either the same ones or related to the ones that you kept bringing the princess through right mm. and so they're they're probably going to be coming back and it's like oh it's you again and then you're going to hear them talking to you, like, for the rest of the time. You know, berating you for, why are you, do why, why were you, like, making friends with this human? Why do you, did you need to, to impress by doing this through us? We helped, too, and all this other stuff that they're going to say <laughs> in your ear. So... <clears throat> Just 
tough choice. Um, I don't like the idea that these plants in here are part of the curse and so they might mislead me or lead me into a trap or lie to me or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's go with that one. Nice. Okay. Two light, one dark, please. Mm, that's a five light. Nice. You want to stay or you want to like add a dark die and reroll for funsies? Let's stay. Okay. It's fine. We've been rolling too well so far for Trophy Dark. No, really? Seriously? <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, so tell me what this looks like as you succeed, and then I will tell you how things are a little bit complicated. Yeah, I think Ekamea runs through the corridors and finds so you come to a, comes to a place where the where the roof has collapsed and there are and it's just this beam of sunlight like shaft of sunlight shining down into the space and he stands in that and just is rooted to the spot and begins to begins to transform you know her body hardening and twisting and for a while, you can still see her face there, but before long, she's more tree than human, and the limbs reach up to this to this crack in the ceiling, reaching for the light. I think as you make your change, and you know, you start to become one as the rest of the plants and the tree life here, I think you start to hear their voices. You start to hear their, their way of talking, you know, dry and um, dry, but possibly also flexible and willowy and just gossipy even maybe. Um, and they'll start saying things like, Ah, uh, so little time has passed, and these humans are still unmoving, except for these new ones, of course. Huh. Look at the beast. The beast roams as he always does. Huh. <sighs> Hear him mutter and cry. They're like, they're just like gossipy bitches, I swear to God, <laughs> because like the beast is like, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, like swinging his head and he will come upon your cluster of trees, you know, where you are. And he kind of like lolls his shaggy head around and I think he's going to come nearer and he kind of smashes the walls you know, just randomly, but then he'll come to your tree, Akamea, and then he'll kind of like breathe and snort heavily in front of you. But then you realize if you can see or you can sense, I think you realize he's crying while he's also bellowing and screaming. And what you hear is, oh, no. No, she was promised to me. We were betrothed years ago. I will awaken her. I will be her true love. And as he says love, he smashes his fist into your side. Take the condition. Broken branches? Or bruised bark. I mean, whatever you think is appropriate for this. And then he'll he'll slough off again, maybe in search of, of Teoden. Teoden, as you make your way and hear these whispers of all the rumors that you were mongering in your past, I think... I think in the 
kind of like hazy sensory way that you are able to see things now. I think each room that you pass has a tableau of some sort, as if you can see the invisible servants among the sculptures. And they're tempting you, they're calling out to you, even while they're making fun of your, your rumor mongering, but they tempt you to join them. What does it look like when some of them will say, Oh, back to your noble self, sir. The grand name of your family name shall be great again. The tapestry shall hang proudly on the walls by the dais, by the thrones. That will be something, won't it? I think uh, I am enticed by this. I know they can't be real or else they wouldn't be able to see me because I'm masked and yet they see me, but they must be right. They can't be wrong. Um, and so I'll indulge this vision in the, the room I'm passing and, and tell them, yes, of course, but First, I need to reach the princess, and I seem to have been turned around. Oh, no, no, no. Do you no, point no. me you, towards the you, tower? Of course, but you need to show your best. And again, in this hazy tableau, it's like you, you can feel yourself being like measured and checked. Um, like maybe like it's a tailor, you know, because you can sense him asking you the questions that you would get for like, you know, what kind of lapel, what kind of cravat, what kind of colors, and all this kind of stuff that he's asking you as you're in this, in this um, room uh, that you can sort of perceive, but it's like, it's all like a dream, basically. And uh, Akamea, as you stand there listening to the gossip of the, of the trees, and kind of, I guess, maybe feeling out the, 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 the hit from the beast. I think maybe in your perception flutters that single dried petal from the blossom. But you can also hear something singing to you. You hear the princess's voice singing from somewhere above you. Come find me, come wake me, come love me. Getting to her means getting what you want. What do you yeah, think? I find my way to the shower in the trees. You can travel just as you traveled before in the past, joining us with your playmate. You can travel through the vines and the branches. They lead to the turret, to the princess's room. Easy as blowing in the wind. Let me see if I can follow what they're suggesting. What's it feel like to you when you do travel through, like it's almost like phasing perhaps as you travel mm. through the trees. Is it like entering a liminal forest or is it like... <laughs> It's like an awareness of the interconnectedness of all the of all the life. And once that awareness is there that it's one thing, then you can be at any place within that web of life and then step out the other side. Think when you step out to the other side maybe you even hear that song again 
and also remember a memory. Were you trying to impress? Or did you care for the princess just a little? I did care for her, but I was trying to impress because I was lonely. She can ease your loneliness. She can be with you like no one else, even your betrothed. Bear the flower if you must, bloom as you will, but only you can decide who actually gets it in the end. What was that I saw in the moat? Was it real? As real as you and I. As real as we are. Teoden, they finished your suit. This, this beautiful thing of dream stuff. Even in your hazy perception, what does it feel like to be almost to that end of your proud self, your noble name? It feels justified, like, like the more I believe that I am being restored to, to who I was, the less I feel remorse over having been cast out in the first place. And the more I feel that I only did what anyone would do. And in the time since, none of it mattered. None of it was of consequence. Um, this, this restoration to myself is as it should be. And as you make your way up the stairs, or through the plants and liminal space, you will find a set of small circular stairs leading up to the still upright turret. The princess awaits. The view is from below, looking up. You each come to the tower at the same time, and yet the camera, we, the audience, see each of you at a different level of the staircase, calling out in desperation to the loved one that you will not disappoint. So ends ring four. Ring five, the princess. This is the princess's room. Here she sleeps. You see her prostrate form bedecked in finery befitting her station. It is as she is only sleeping. She is as she was ten years ago. She has not aged since her twenty-first birthday, when the curse took hold. A jarring light suddenly changes the atmosphere, as the single window in this well-appointed room shows the dawn shining in, but it smiles a sinister light a red as if it would burn blood in the dark sky. You blink, oblivious of anyone else in the room except her unconscious form as you approach the bed. Her voice murmurs into your ear and your ear alone. You have traveled so far and been through so much to come to me. What do you offer? in order to wake me from this cursed dream. It is you. It has always been you alone to save me. No one else. Don't let anyone else take this opportunity from you. What vision do you get, each of you? What vision do you get what would it mean if you failed? 
think um, I have a vision of not just returning to you know, the last 10 years of shame, longer than 10 years at this point after having been cast out, but sort of compiled upon that somehow being cast out yet again because failure would mean that whatever I brought the princess was not good enough. And that not only, you know, did I, did I fail once, but my assurance that everything is back to as it should be was again wrong. And, and it, it would have hurt twi twice as much. So I have this vision of all this, the stone servants and noblemen and the princess herself sort of, uh, chasing me out again of this ruined castle, humiliated. Be alone. Lost in a forest that doesn't want me because I'm not of the Fae and humanity that doesn't want me because I'm not human. And the one person that accepted me for who I was will be gone. I think as you each come out of your vision, you notice by the bed ritual implements, a dagger, a lit candle, a length of rope, and a vial of poison. And then you see red, the one whom your loved one warned you about, the one whom the person at the table warned you about. They are in front of you, regardless of perception. Basically, you each think that the other is in front of you, ready to awaken the princess. What do you do? It's always been you alone to save me. No one else. Don't let anyone else take this opportunity from you. I think I've tried to use the ritual compel. <laughs> okay. Is there any, uh, well, okay. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly how this will work. Yeah. Well, what, do, okay. So it has to be non-lethal, non-lethal task, but right, what, right. what would you compel? I'm assuming Akamea, <laughs> what would you, what would you compel Akamea to do? I think, um, my first instinct was simply leave, but I think I think Tyrden is pettier than that and would simply say freeze so that Ekamea has to stay there to watch while I awaken the princess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think freeze. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And Ekamea, what would you like to do? I think that plays right into my hands. Okay. Because my plan <laughs> is to my plan is to freeze and become a tree and one limb will grow across the room toward the sleeping princess. And at the end of it, a single blossom will bloom. Ah! Sorry. But I don't know that. <laughs> oh, incroyable. Okay. So I'm going to say that this is stakes, right? So, I mean, like, this is a contest role. You're going against each other because you are trying to get there first. Um, or like, you know, make sure that, you know, you've held the other fast, basically. So whomever wins will get their particular action off first. Um, that'll be the, that'll be the stakes. So yeah, you're trying to, to outdo each other. Let's build the contest roll. Agree on, upon what is at stake, getting there first. Uh, each competing player now. You're going to take a dark die if the contest itself is inherently de deadly or dangerous. Compelled to freeze, do the blossom. I mean, 
Not well, necessarily. Yeah. 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 I mean, we'll see what the what the outcome is, basically. Um so take the dark die for the contest itself, okay? And then a light die for uh each hold on. Yeah, if you light die if you have a skill or equipment that makes the contest easier. Spinning rituals again. I'm using mm -hmm, the same mm -hmm. one all night. Well, I mean, like, spam it when you got it, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Teoden, what you got? Um, For compel. Tri uh, trickery or performance, but probably... Stomp. Yeah. It's literally, like, in that meaning of the word charm, right, Josh? Yeah, yeah that's true. It is a charm, in part of us, yes. Yep. You get the one that. light. Yeah, I mean, like, regardless of like how many skills or whatever, I mean, it's still right. the one light die. All right, now you're going to take one light die for each mark of ruin you currently have. So for both of you, it's the same. So you're you're going to do each do five light die. Okay, so you're going to build it in the dice roller. So contest roll, you know, five light die, and then the dark die, the first dark die for the inherently dangerous thing. And then you would decide yourself how many additional dark dice you are willing to risk. But remember that any dark dice that comes up as a one will automatically add one point of ruin to your total. All right. Basically, we're going to be you're going to roll the dice once you figure out all your numbers and whatever. We're going to count the sixes. Whoever has the most sixes will win if there's a tie down to fives, down to fours, you know, until we no longer have a tie and we have a clear winner, okay? But remember, every dark die that comes up as a one, you gain ruin, okay? So keep that in mind as you're building your dice pool. Five light die for each, a uh, five light die for each of you, and then however many dark die you want to use. <laughs> Undercut, that's roll. Not stressful, you yeah. know, it's just, it's all good. It's all fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so just tell me when you when you got your numbers, and then I'll tell you when to. I'm ready. I'm ready. Okay, and roll. Okay. Oh, Jesus! One, two, three, <laughs> six is recommend. Recommend wins. Known. You win, You go up by one, and you also go up by one, Teoden. But yeah, you sure. definitely lost. Oh no. Okay. Yeah, and it wasn't close. No, no, not at all. So, tell me how you get there first, Ekamea, and then for Teoden, you can tell me how your ritual or the interruption of such, like, you know, does not go off. I was going to say, it's part of my narration that it does go off and that Ekamea does freeze. But then, once frozen, she transforms and turns into, turns to bark and wood. And yeah, as I described it, the, the one limb of the, of the tree that she turns into kind of reaches, grows across the room to the sleeping form. And it's not that it's growing faster than Erdogan can move, but I think he thought he had time, given that yeah. what he'd done. And just the weirdness of what he's seeing, I guess. I don't want to speak for him, his reaction to yeah. it. But... Yeah. Uh, I did not see you transform into a tree at any point in the past. It's not something that was anywhere in my in my realm of awareness or understanding. And so... Uh, seeing you freeze, I feel a sense of triumph and maybe even turn to the ritual table to see what exactly, you know, might be useful. I don't know, there's a branch. Well, what is a branch going to do? But what is and the, the, bro okay. the blossom blooms at the end of the branch? It's like the bud as the branch grows, the bud forms and splits open and and there's the sound at the end above the sleeping form and 
that's the gift I give to wake her up. Yeah, I mean, like, there's this red light coming from the window, and it accentuates the light on her face, and your, I mean, if the blossom touches, or like, you know, the pollen, you know, touches her first before Teoden can react, then, yeah, I think she will open up her eyes and she will look into the blossom and look into you Ekamea and it is if it's as if Teoden is not there where you feel her awaken and then will take your form you know either as a tree or a hybrid of such and bring you over to the window you have won now come and see your reward she's whispering as she brings you to the window you can't look away i see maybe what she takes to the window is the is the blossoms in the tree mm-hmm. and the way Ekin, Ekinaya sees what it is outside is like as I described before, uh, like reaching out through the little of a network of life and seeing in that way. The red sun burns itself onto your petals. Do you see yourself worthy? Worthy of a princess? See your reward. May it burn into your vision as I will burn my way into your heart. Interpret that as you will. Teoden, what happens when you see this? When you see the blossom awaken the princess? And she takes it to the window. I think I I can't help but feel like I'm trapped in some bizarre nightmare and none of it makes sense. Like there's not even a a human to awaken the princess. Like that that it's not how it's supposed to go. Um I think uh at first I'm stunned, but as I see her, you know, speaking quietly to a tree holding a blossom i can't help but i can't help but but shout maybe um tell her no it's me like do you not see me do you know this is not right this is all wrong but no you never took off the mask <laughs> So, this is your chance for epilogues, either immediately after or in the distant future. Since you've both survived, I need to know in your epilogues how you have forever been changed by this. Make it as weird and okay. wonderful as you want, but just can't implicate the other player. <laughs> The other character. Um, everything turned on its head for Teoden. I think we we cut to an unknown number of years in the future, maybe in the town of of Edgemore, was it? Mm-hmm. Um, in like a shack towards the edge of town, and. We see Teoden, and he is in bad shape. Um, I think in the the years since the events at the castle, um, what he hoped would clear up something that made no sense to him to begin with only made everything worse. And... Uh, he's resorted to sort of withdrawn into himself um, 
hidden behind this this proverbial mask to to totally withdraw from society um just do what he must live each day empty knowing that he will never earn the right to his family's name or enter the castle again that's it Mayor? Yeah, I think similar number of years hence we see the princess in the in the tower. She's older and is festooned with climbing plants, ivy and climbing roses and everything inside and out and she's walking up the spiral staircase to the to the top of the tower and pushes open the door and says oh my love and there growing in the corner of the room is the same tree that Ekamea transformed into Amazing. And that is the end of our tale. So, stars and wishes. <laughs> Gameplay, roleplay, each other, <laughs> my incursion, I mean, whatever. And then um, wishes are, eh, I mean, like if there was something that you wish had happened or that we followed through with. You know, I'm planning on trying to work this into like, you know, expanding it for a two shot, you know, but uh, I figure like a one shot is like at least getting it done. <laughs> so yeah, it, it works well as a one shot. I think it's, it's got the, it's got the fairy tale vibes just right. And yeah, I liked the, the set pieces of the, the bridge and the, and the feast hall. Yeah, I don't know. I had what fun with it. Uh, I think I kind of got lucky because I just kind of spun out this character that turned out to fit really well with what was going on um, and just kept giving me ideas all the way through. I wasn't planning like the way it went at all. Um, and I enjoyed Ed and I, I, I like would have loved to have seen some more of that history of this these scurrilous rumors he's been spreading and just how he disgraced himself and was was pitched out but kind of did it for yeah then then I like that twist that he came back because he because of like this self destructive impulse that he heard about in the Princess, and so there was something there that he cared about after all, and he wasn't just a total snake. Um, that was a really interesting take on, on that type of character because you know, you could it could have been easily like he's the he's there to kind of claim her and you know, use her to, to restore his position in the family or whatever. But I think there was a more subtle and interesting thing going on there that I really enjoyed. Yeah, I don't know. I, I come with it. It was great. It was, yeah, I thought it was a good, good size of one shot. I mean, you should, uh, no doubt you could spin it out, but like it works at this length, I feel like. Okay. Cool. Yeah, stars, yeah, for the, for the, the story in the setting, I think, um, especially the, the descriptive language throughout is, it's, really sets the um these very evocative scenes which is great um also provides a real sense of danger which is essential with something that i guess it could lean a little like towards the the mystical end of the fairy tale vibe i think we were very much in the grime and the danger of it which i appreciated um i think um as Rob said, it, it worked well as a one shot. I could absolutely imagine it stretching into a two shot. I think each ring had like 
a spot where probably there would be more to uncover, uh, more castle to get lost in, more uh, more beastly things to face. Um, but the little like twists about like the beast's history, uh, things like uh, you know that were sort of scattered throughout. You could really see uh, sort of digging our teeth into. Um, yeah, yeah, I would have loved to know who the beast was. I was going to ask the trees that, and then I kind of got sidetracked. <laughs> so, so a potential fate for a, a, someone with the princess. Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, was the princess even the princess anymore? All of these are, are wonderful little questions we could, you know, dig into. Um, Rob, uh, definitely great, great job on constructing that character and always taking it in directions I couldn't predict. I think that was really fun uh, and a really cool uh, sort of being to play off of in such a, such a like you said, well-matched setting. Um, I think it really meshed very nicely with everything. Yeah. Um, in terms of wishes, I kind of wish we rolled worse. Uh, I know. Early on. Yeah, right? Yeah. I was We're really wondering what for... happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I could have um, laid we were... on the terror a lot more <laughs> with like if right. the rolls weren't badly. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it was what it was. <laughs> but though. you know, yeah, that's that's randomness for you, and I think everyone you know everyone played well with it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that was really the only big wish. Is uh, yeah, even more uh, accidental darkness, but yeah. as it was. It, it, it went very nicely. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, like, I really enjoyed these characters. I mean, I was marveling at <laughs> at how uh, how well Ekamei figured into this into this uh, particular incursion. Um, so, I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, like, it it just like kind of really entangled itself well i'm sorry for the pun um but i mean it was it actually uh, worked out really well with trying to get through some of the obstacles and then like you know trying to communicate with the castle in in her own way and then teoden i mean like you know because of your haunting of of echoes and all this kind of stuff i mean it was just very tragic i mean this was the most i guess um sad <laughs> ending in terms of like not being completely devastatingly deadly but just melancholy like melancholic melancholic tragedy um uh, basically and i mean you know some fairy tales work out that way and so it kind of it, it really fit which i was also pleased about and um yeah i i mean like the things that i was going to add to each ring were were pretty much like you know more to the terror more to the temptations and then just really trying to to get more of your stories out right and then like you could have found out more about the beast if you were curious and and such and so forth but i mean again for fitting it into a one shot you know it it, it did what it needed to do <laughs> so hopefully i'll have this out on itch within the next month or so and uh, at least yeah, it's, it's always hard to tell us there's like more that we're like, did we just step past something, or is it something that could be fleshed out more? Like, because it's hard to tell how much there is to the beast, or because maybe we just kind of sideswiped it and yeah, you you you, you kind of did. You you rolled both so well that I'm like, what the hell am I gonna do? You know what I mean? It's like I can't really can't really make it ruinous for you because it's like you know you just succeeded and that's what it was. But uh, yeah, I mean, like, I, I appreciated all of your answers. I mean, like, you know, the, the prompt uh, answers were very uh, evocative for each of your characters, like for what you thought and what you felt. So I, I really love that. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, like, I, it always amazes me and delights me to see how people interpret each of the things. And it's never the same, never the same twice, you know? Even if we did have another Teoden, <laughs> I mean, different, very different character. So I had fun running this for you and, uh, you know, I'm glad that you had a good time. So yeah, hope, hopefully uh, other people will, you know, once I have it out, will feel inspired to run it and let me know how it goes. So yeah, it's cool. Right. Thank, Thank you, you both. both. Yeah, absolutely. 
And we will hopefully return with everybody together for uh, the strangeness in Canada next week. And uh, <laughs> happy gaming for um, everything that you're doing for this particular week until we meet again. Okay? So, have a yeah. nice, See nice you guys. soon. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Bye. Bye.